Amen. If you want to hear the sermon that goes along with that song, stay for the next service. <laughs> they did that because they, they know that I'm in Luke, and the next section at Luke talks about the woman with the issue of blood, and uh, that is my sermon for the second service. But since we're having the Lord's, I can't call it the Lord's Supper in the morning, since we're having communion, you get to go to Matthew chapter 26. This is a, a sacred time in our church. We don't do this in the mornings, or we haven't in the past, very often. This is a church thing. And when I speak of the church, I don't speak of Spring Valley Baptist Church. I speak of the body of Christ. This is, this is the body of Christ thing. This is what born-again believers, followers of Jesus Christ are about. And there's two ordinances in the Bible. One of them is baptism, and the other is the Lord's Supper. And uh, we Baptists like to call it the Lord's Supper, except if you go to the Baptist bookstore. They call it communion. When my daughter was being interviewed to go to the mission field, she was in Richmond, and she called me, and she said, Dad, they have a problem with, with me and my, my doctrine. And uh, I said, what's that? She said, well, they wanted me to uh, talk about the Lord's Supper, and I called it communion. And they don't know if I really understand the Lord's Supper since I called it communion. And one of the trustees said, girl... Baptists do not call this communion. And she said, Dad, are you a Baptist? I said, yeah. And she said, when we lived in Claremore, and I was going to Tulsa, and it was near the day that we were going to take the Lord's Supper, you would say, stop by the Baptist bookstore and get some communion cups. She said, that's what it says on the box. Communion cups. And I said, yes. And uh, she said, well, I wouldn't be having this problem if you'd have told me to stop and get some Lord's Supper cups. <laughs> I talked to that trustee and told him his issue wasn't with me and my daughter. His issue was with the Baptist bookstore. They need to change the name of the box. Because if I'd have sent her after Lord's Supper cups, they would say, sorry, we don't have those. But we do have some communion cups. They might work for you. We, we, we call it the Lord's Supper because it happened in the evening. And, and it was evening meal. In fact, to, to be honest with you, most everything after Jesus' resurrection and, and prior to Jesus' resurrection concerning the church happened on Sunday evening. And, and the reason for that is that Sunday's the first day of the week. And uh, it, it's the day of Jesus' resurrection. David prophesied you know, that this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Do you realize that keeping the Sabbath is the only commandment that is not repeated in the New Testament? Why? Because we're not Jews. And, and the Sabbath law was given to the Jews. Now, as born-again believers, we worship God on Sunday. And it's really a sad thing that in our culture and in the world today, Sunday has just become another day and not a day of worship. Because this is the day, and so we take the Lord's Supper. But just imagine back during that time when they would have the Lord's Supper, when they would meet together in homes or in, in the catacombs, wherever it was that they, they met. They had worked all day. That, that was a work day. It was like our Monday and you know how you feel on Monday night. You, that's just not the best time. But they had worked all day, and they had come together. And in order to get things together in their mind, they paused for a moment to remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. To remember that his body was broken for us, and that his blood was shed for us. 
And Jesus instituted this just before he was crucified in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. They're eating the, the Passover meal, by the way. That's, that's what this is all about there. Jesus is, is the final Passover sacrifice. And they're eating the Passover meal. And as they're eating the meal, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and that would have been the uh, unleavened bread that they ate during Passover. Jesus took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. It would have been a chunk about this size and just wafer thin, and he broke it, and he passed it to the disciples. And as he did that, he gave it to the disciples and said, eat, take, eat, this is my body. Now, each one would take that that piece of bread, and I imagine he passed one on his his right and on his left, and they would take that piece of bread, and they would break it, take a little piece off of it, and pass it to the next person. By the way, do you know what Jesus said just before he instituted the Lord's Supper? He said, okay, all you guys that want in the picture, get on this side of the table. That, we know they weren't sitting at a table, were they? they? They were lying, reclining, as they always did when they ate, and they were kind of in a horseshoe. And uh, so they're passing this bread around, and he said, take, eat. This is my body. Was it really the body of Christ? No. Did it become the body of Christ? No. Was there some mysterious thing that happened that after he blessed it, it became the body of Christ? Or after they ate it, it became the body of Christ? No. It was a cracker. It was a a piece of bread. It was a symbol of his body. You see, his body was before them. And his body didn't, he didn't lose any, any body parts as they ate this bread. His body was before them. So it was symbolic of what was about to happen to him. Redemption. And tonight when we do the Lord's Supper, we're going to talk about redemption. I just didn't want to give some of you the same sermon twice. Okay, so we'll do this one today. Then the Bible says, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. Now, there's something in that phrase that you and I need to understand. Before Jesus tells them what this is, he says, this means total commitment. Drink all of this. This is not, this is not sipping wine. Turn this up like you do your morning orange juice and drink all of it. And then he says this. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let me tell you something. I believe the reason Jesus said, drink all of it, is that he knew that through the ages, this very statement and this truth was going to be contested. And it's being contested today. What silliness there is in the thought that we can be forgiven of our sins by the blood of Jesus. You know, the Bible says the preaching of the cross and the shedding of the blood is foolishness to those that are lost. If we deny that it was the sinless blood of Jesus that brings us freedom from the penalty of sin, and sets us free and redeems us from sin, we've just denied our salvation. And and I believe all of that's wrapped up in a lot of stuff. When the Bible tells us that there is no other name in which we must be saved, it's really talking about the sacrifice of that one person, Jesus Christ, his sinless blood. You know, sin is in, in, in the blood, If, if you lived back in where I came from in Oklahoma, you're always coming across roadkill. Dead raccoon or, or maybe a possum. Sometimes it's a pet or a farm animal. 
that has been hit by a car and destroyed. That carcass will lie there, and it, it's amazing that as it deteriorates, it, it doesn't have a, a distinctive smell. It, it really doesn't. But if you've ever noticed when a hurricane or a, or a uh, tornado comes through, by the way, I, my son-in-law's sister's house last Wednesday, she was at church, praise God, but there was a tornado went through near St. Louis where she lives, took the roof of the north end of her house, and then a tree fell over the south end. And the tree, she had a basement. The tree didn't just fall through the roof, but fell all the way through the basement. And uh, we're praying for them and, and three little children, the oldest being four years old. But God protected them. Boy, aren't they glad they went to church Wednesday night? But if we see a hurricane and we see death in a hurricane or, or a tornado... You'll notice that people carrying the bodies are wearing masks. That is protection from the, the germs and things like that that might be going. But I'll tell you what, do you know what? They also pinch their noses because the smell is horrible. Do you remember years ago when the little baby was found or, or the residue of a baby was found in the trunk of a car and, and the mother had put the baby in the car and left it there for some time? And months and months later, you could smell the body. You could smell the residue. Why is that? Why, why is the death of human beings and the smell at death different than in animals? Because sin is in the blood. Now, a dog might be mean, but he's not a sinner. Man is the only one that has the ability to sin and the cognitive things to sin. So Jesus lived his life without sin. His blood was pure. Now, he says this, I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. That talks about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, to me, the Lord's Supper is a picture of the sinless body and the sinless blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the second coming. It's a reminder that he's coming again. And he's coming soon. I believe that. Now, will you go with me to 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That was the initiation of the Lord's Supper. Now we're going to talk about the, not, not the explanation, but actually a command uh, concerning the Lord's Supper. So if you, if you look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23, we're going to talk about the meaning of the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul is talking. Now, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he did it with the disciples. Actually, he did it with 11 of the disciples because Judas had already left the room when Jesus began to share about his body and his blood. But he did it to his what? To his followers. So the Lord's Supper really is for his followers. It's not for anybody else. If you, if you look at the Lord's Supper or communion today and you think, I'll take that and that will save me. No, you have to be saved. You have to know the Lord Jesus Christ before you take this. Otherwise, you'll just be drinking grape juice. And somebody says, you don't use real wine. Let me tell you what, the blood of Jesus was pure. No contaminants. And so the juice we drink is as pure as we can find it. Welch's, I think. One day, one of our yoke fellows did sleep in some juicy juice, and we, we caught him, though. But we try and get as, as pure as, as we can, because the, it reminds us of the pure blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other reason for that. And then, for I have Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. You see, Paul wants you to understand 
that what he's about to say about the Lord's Supper is the same thing that the disciples heard from Christ himself. But listen to this. Paul said, I received this from Christ also. You realize that after Paul was saved on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9, that he was sent into the Arabian Desert three years. And there he was instructed by who? By the Lord himself. You see, one of the qualifications of being a, an apostle is to have been with the Lord and have been instructed by the Lord and have received your teaching from him. You know, maybe that's where we get the idea of seminary, three years, and you're good to go. Well, the disciples had walked with the Lord for three years, and Paul says in several places, Paul, an apostle, called by God, not by man, but an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, he also had spent three years with the Lord. I doubt if they were 24-hour days, but the Lord instructed him during that period of time. And he says, I've received this of the Lord, and I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, or yes, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. There's the reason. The, the reason we partake of the bread this morning is not so that we will be better people. It is so that we will remember the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. He gave his life a ransom for many. He shed his blood for the remission of sins. The book of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And we're to remember that. And, and, and today, while you're sitting there listening to me, you need to, as a follower of Christ, just pause for a moment in your heart and in your mind and say, Lord, I realize there's no goodness in me, and I'm only saved by the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this reminds us of. And then he says this. He says, after the same manner also, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, the cup is the New Testament in my blood. The New Covenant. Here's a word of instruction. The Old Covenant was keep the law. And since you can't keep the law, bring a sacrifice of atonement at the end of the year. And if you will bring the proper sacrifice, your sins will be rolled back for another year. You're good for a year, and you're okay. Then there were many smaller sacrifices that you brought to the synagogue and you brought to the temple for your sins. But he said this, I want you to, I want you to do this. This is the New Testament in my blood. Here's the new covenant. I am the final sacrifice. Have you ever been to a, a, a Catholic church or a Catholic cathedral? In a Catholic cathedral, the, the big thing in the Catholic cathedral is the altar. Of course, when Catholics wear, usually when they wear a, a cross around their, their neck, Christ is still on the cross. You say, well, why don't we have an altar in, in the Baptist church? Because the cross was the final altar. An altar is where you make a sacrifice. And the final sacrifice was made on the cross. And when Jesus said, this is the new covenant, he says, no longer do you have to come once a year and have your sins roll back. No longer do you have to make a, a sacrifice of atonement. Why? He is the eternal sacrifice. The sacrifice for your sins, past, present, and future. He's the eternal sacrifice. Now, 
As, as we, we think of that and we, we look at that, he says, I want you to say, this is the, the cup, of the New Testament. And how, how, did, how did this arrive? How, how did we come to this new covenant? Margie and I are, are working on a, a marriage seminar that we're going to be doing in, in Texas. And, and uh, it's been fun for us. We spend about an hour each evening, sometimes an hour and a half, looking at the scriptures. And, and I'm the preacher. And I can tell her what the scriptures mean, but it's been kind of embarrassing because, you know, this is, this is what this scripture means. This is what a husband is supposed to do. And sometimes she looks at me and says, like, yeah, when are you going to start that? I was embarrassed the other evening when I said to her, I said, do you remember when we, when we began to do this? And she said, we did. You see, the problem with us as human beings is we think we're doing good. But when we really get down to it, there is nothing good. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. And Jesus said, here it is. Here is the beginning. I made the ultimate sacrifice. I gave my blood in order that you would never have to make another sacrifice for your sins. I think one of the most difficult truths to get across to a lost person is this. You don't have to go to church to be saved. You don't have to read your Bible to be saved. You, you don't have to give to be saved. What you have to do is to believe on the sacrifice, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, believe that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again. And then a miraculous thing happens. If you truly believe that in your heart, you'll want to go fellowship with God's people. You'll want to read God's word. You'll want to share of your resources with God's people. That, that's just proof of your salvation. If you haven't been nice to your wife, when you get saved, you'll want to be nice to her. You, that changes. And you say, well, none of that's happened to me. Well, maybe you ought to check out your salvation. Because it does happen. He says, this is the blood of the, the new covenant. And as often as you drink it, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Do what? Remember that you are in a right relationship with God for one reason only. Jesus died for your sins. Have, have you ever had to uh, forgive somebody who wronged you? And boy, it's, it was hard to do. They, they, they need to make some kind of recompense. They, they, they need to suffer a little bit before you forget. I had a lady in our church one time say to me, say, I know I need to forgive them, but I'm not going to do it this week. They need to suffer a little bit. It's hard to forgive, isn't it? Do you know why it is? Because when you forgive somebody, you have to absorb the hurt. You just have to gut it up and say, as badly as they hurt me, I'm going to forget this. I'm not going to bring it up. I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to move on with my life. I'm, I'm going to treat them as though this never happened. That's difficult. That's hard to do. On the cross, Jesus absorbed the hurt. What was the hurt? The penalty for sin is death. Now, we understand death. When a person dies in our church and they bring the casket here in front and we walk by at the end of the service, we realize that the soul and the spirit has separated from the body. Death is a separation. The wages of sin is death. And it's not talking about dying physically. It's talking about the wages of sin is being separated from God. Remember on the cross, Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He absorbed the hurt. Can you? I, I, Jerry Vines preached a sermon one time. He was pastor at First Baptist Church, Jacksonville, Florida. And I heard, in fact, he preached it right here in Las Vegas. And he said, God separating himself from God. 
you could more easily unscramble an egg. How would that be? What a tearing away that must have been. Because God the Father is separated from God the Son. God the Son is separated from the Holy Spirit. What pain that must have been. What torture that must have been. But in order for you and I to be saved, it had to be. And that's why we remember the Lord's death. Till he comes. Another reason why we don't do it very often is because we, we don't want it to become a ritual where we just do it. We, we really want to hear the preacher say something about it. We really want to take a moment to think about it. And you know, the Bible says later, it says we need to examine our hearts about this. So he says that as often as you eat this bread, and drank this cup, you show the Lord's death till he comes. This is your witness. Baptism is a witness. In the second service today, we're going to baptize some folks. It's a witness. They believe that Jesus died and he was buried, so we will bury them under the water. That's the reason we don't sprinkle. My bulldog died. And we didn't set it in the corner and just sprinkle some dirt on it. Or we didn't have the kids get their little toy buckets and fill some dirt and just go pour dirt on it. No, we buried the dog. Baptism is a burial. But it is also a witness that we believe that Jesus who was buried rose again on the third day. So it's a witness. When you take the Lord's Supper today as a believer, you're giving a witness I believe when I eat this cracker that Jesus lived a perfect life. Never lied, never cheated, never lusted, never disobeyed his father, which that's what sin is. I believe that when I take that cracker today, I believe Jesus lived a perfect life. I'm giving witness to that. When I drink that cup today, I'm saying I believe Jesus died a sinless life. That his blood was pure. That sin didn't flow through his veins like sin flows through our veins. Jesus was not the son of Adam. Jesus was the second Adam. I believe that. It's a witness. We often stop there, but I think we need to, to go on. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let, let's not make this say something that it doesn't say. If you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ... If you have not committed yourself to follow him, for you to hypocritically take the cracker, drink the juice, would be the same as driving nails in Jesus' hands. You're mocking him, and you're mocking what this ordinance really means. That's the reason it says in verse 28, let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I, I truly believe that what that means is you need to ask yourself this question. Have I truly submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ? Examine your heart. I can't do it. Our yoke fellows can't do it. Examine your heart. Have I committed to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Have I truly done that? Do I truly believe that Jesus lived a perfect life? 
am I totally convinced that Jesus died a sinless death? Is my assurance of a resurrection based on the fact that I know in my heart that Jesus rose from the grave? And am I taking of this bread and cup today in remembrance that Jesus is coming back and I believe that he is? Let's just take for a few moments. Will you bow your heads, please? I would ask you this question. Are you a true believer? Are you a follower of the Lord Jesus? Do you believe in your heart that it's because of your sin that Jesus had to die? It's a good question to ask yourself. Do you truly believe today that by committing yourself to follow Jesus will save your soul from eternal separation from God? I mean, are you convinced of that? Is that where you place your faith? Are you relying today on the perfect life of Jesus and the sinless death of Jesus to bring you into a proper relationship with God? And your heads are bowed, and everybody should be asking yourselves these questions, but I have a question I want to ask you. Are you saying to yourself, you know, I've never done that, but I would like to? And before they pass that bread and cup today, I would like to make that commitment. I pray the Holy Spirit will give you the boldness and the courage and the wisdom to do that. Give you the boldness right now to lift your hand and say, Preacher, never have committed myself to these truths, but I would like to. Will you pray for me? Is there anyone here who would raise your hand and say, Preacher, I've never done that, but I would like to. Will you pray for me? Anybody? Thank you. Father, we come to you today as believers, as Christ followers. And what we're about to do now, we do in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Men, if you'll come, please, and prepare to distribute the Lord's Supper. Who's going to pray? Okay. Will you bless the bread, please? Lord, as we come at this time to remember the sacrifice, Lord, that you made for us. Father, there's no way we can understand. But Lord, I just thank you and praise you that you don't, you don't require us, Father, to understand or to be worthy of it, Father. Lord, that uh, Jesus died, became sin for us, for such a great salvation. Father, we just thank you and praise you. We ask these fathers, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Is there a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who has missed in the passing of the bread? On the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had blessed it, he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take it and eat. And if you'll come for the passing of the cup, please. Terry. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do thank you for this time to remember the shedding of your blood, to know that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission for sins. Lord Jesus, we just can't thank you enough for this. And Lord, I just pray that you would be here now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Was there a true follower of Christ today who is missed in the passing of the cup? The Bible says in the same manner he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he supped and he said, This is the blood of the new covenant. Drink it. Jesus summed it all up by saying, you do this in remembrance of me. No one's going to leave here more spiritual today because you took the Lord's Supper. No lost person who came in here lost is going to leave saved because you took the Lord's Supper. But hopefully all of us will leave here today thinking about the sacrifice that was made so that we can be saved. That's the purpose. The Bible says, then they sung a hymn and they went out to pray. I would like to to change that today and say, let's sing a hymn and then let's go out to witness. God bless you. Amen. Pastor John, before we sing that final hymn, I want Joel, he's starting his class today, and I want him to tell the people about that. Step right up there to the microphone, brother. Good morning, everyone. We're going to launch a, a, a Filipino Bible study, a new Sunday school. If anyone you have encountered with uh, these folks, new immigrants, and trying to learn the Bible or would like to, to help them, we have a new class. We call ourselves Truth Trackers, and... Um, I would like to join us uh, where old truths once trod are being traced by these new generation of new immigrants. They call themselves truth trackers. And uh, we're going to start uh, after this service at room number six. Okay. And what language Thank you. are you doing that in? We're going to do the Taglish, uh, Tagalog uh, version and English, you know. Okay. Yeah, everybody knows that. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Brother Joel. Let's stand together as we go out, church. To know you, that's my desire. To know you and all of your power. To know you as you need me through the fire. And I'll die to myself so I can know you. Have a great week. To know you, that's my desire. To know you and all of your power. To know you as you need me through the fire. And I'll die to myself so I can know you. Yes, I'll die to myself so I can know you. I'm gonna die to myself so I can know you.